Our next speaker, Dr. Richard Wang, is Assistant Professor of History at Suga Suigo. Um, he's got a PhD from the University of Chicago, Chicago, and he's a Detroit Red Wings fan, and a hockey player. But he's a blooming uh, near Comenza fan coming up, too. Um, he's an expert in the French fur trade of the 18th century, and he's getting very deep into the French Indian War, and the uh, Suigo, excuse me, the Mohawk Oneida Oswego uh, water route to the Great Lakes. Uh, he's been, uh, he has a unique ability to explain and interpret complex issues to people like me, and make light bulbs of understanding go off in our heads. Right? Uh, he really can tell you the big picture of the French Indian War and events here and how they're related to Europe. Um, <coughs> Today, Rich Wang is going to review uh, North American stories that have gone before and give some insights into what um, what the Marquis de Montcalm's background was like it, and why it, it, how it influenced uh, the, the Marquis de Montcalm's uh, activities in North America during the French and Indian War, his, his experience in, in Europe, of course. Um, he's also on the board of the Friends of Port Ontario and he's been instrumental in working with George Bray, Arthur Simmons, the Roman Historical Society, myself, uh, to put together the bus trip tomorrow of the Oswego down to uh, Oneida Lake and to uh, the Mohawk River. So we look forward to working with him in the future. But in the meantime, he's here to talk about the Marquis de Montcalm. Uh, here he is, Dr. Wayne. First of all, uh, obviously, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you so much for supporting uh, for the programs that we put on here and for supporting us. We go is you know we just heard uh, through a surrogate. You know we're trying to move at a, at a national level to really bring people to understand uh, why they should care about what happened here. So thank you is how I should start off. Um, Next thing I have to correct, uh, Paul Lear made a very grave error. I'm not an assistant professor at SUNY Oswego. I'm an associate professor. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I got promoted in tenure just recently, so I slipped through the cracks somehow. So you'll never be able to get rid of me. Uh, so some of you that goes to uh, say that some of you have met me before. I have spoken at this event, I think, two other times. Uh, and Paul was right to say that I've begun to focus lately particularly on Oswego during the French and Indian War, and in particular within that uh, topic, uh, the siege that occurred here in 1756. Um, and I've been trying to look at it from a variety of angles to really get in a sense of just the bewildering diversity of people that were brought to Oswego because of that engagement, right, and the wider conflict of, of which it was a part. Uh, so I think two years ago I was up here talking about Menominee Indians from present-day Green Bay, Wisconsin, who braved smallpox epidemics to come out here and participate in the siege. Uh, other venues, uh, I've talked about ships carpenters who made their way from Massachusetts to uh, build ships for the Royal Navy here and were caught up in this engagement. So for me, the way I'm approaching it is to try to come at it from a variety of different angles um, and different kind of perspectives, uh, which brings me, of course, to Malcolm. You know, the, the other two uh, sort of angles I mentioned, you might call sort of history from below or sort of social history of ordinary people uh, who don't really make it into the history books too often, what their experiences were like. But you, of course, also have to keep in mind high politics and elites, the men who were commanding as well. Uh, so I think it's time to maybe reassess Montcalm uh, a little bit, at least uh, in this context of Oswego. Uh, why was he here? What, what values did he bring here? Um, and one of the, the, the things about his conduct in this siege, many of you know it was a, it was a huge success, right? Montcalm descended upon Oswego that August of 56 with a rather large force, uh, and it surrendered very quickly. And he was able to obliterate the fortifications, take provisions, destroy ships, and all sorts of other uh, accoutrement of, of war that the British had stockpiled here. And he took about 1,500 or so people prisoner with him back to, uh, to French Canada, to Quebec, to New France. Um, it's an extraordinary event, but one of the things that always stood out to me 
is that when the, the garrison of Oswego surrendered after the death of the, the commandant James Mercer, uh, he refused to grant them the honors of war, which was a very symbolic act in the 18th century. Normally, if a garrison had put up a kind of valiant enough defense, they were given this, and it, it essentially meant that they could march out of, uh, of their, their fortifications uh, with their weapons, uh, with their flags unfurled, um, and playing a, a marching tune of their choosing, usually one of the enemies, actually. Um, but he denied them this. Uh, so he evidently looked upon the defense of Oswego with some disdain. And I, I thought about structuring the entire talk around that moment, but the more I thought about it, it sort of made sense to me why he did that. Uh, Arthur Simmons will be talking in a few minutes after I'm done um, on a topic related to that is that when he arrived with his army, Oswego was in rough shape. People were starving, the, the garrison was mutinous, uh, everything seemed hopeless. Uh, and as people in New France rightly predicted, it kind of fell over like a bundle of sticks, right? So I can kind of see why Montcalm would not honor the garrison who surrendered so quickly um, rather than put up a fight even though conditions were so bad. So this is to say I wanted to think a little bit more broadly about what honor might have meant to him um, and how it might have shaped his conduct sort of in a more general sense once he arrived in, in New France. Oswego is his first campaign, as many of you know. He's here until he dies in 1759. Three years or so, right? A very momentous years in American history. Uh, but what a lot of people don't think about is that prior to coming here, he had served in the King's armies for 30 years in Europe. He'd been in 11 different campaigns. He'd been wounded multiple, multiple times, sometimes gravely. He had been a prisoner of war. Uh, he had risen somewhat within the ranks of the French army during this period. Uh, and it just seems to me that that prehistory is, is vital to understanding who he was. Right? Um, and so that's what I wanted to do today, is to look as best I can in the time I have with the sources that are available as to his sort of prehistory with an eye towards thinking about his values, what honor meant him, what martial honor meant him in the 18th century. Uh, okay, so historians uh, have obviously been thinking about him for a while. Um, in the beginning, there's what I always call a sort of hagiographic tradition in the 19th century, uh, in which national heroes are kind of invented and given almost sort of divine purpose and heroized. Uh, and that was certainly the case with Montcalm, particularly in, in French Canada and in Quebec uh, and in France itself, where he was sort of romanticized as this martyr. Right, to, to a lost cause. And so you see works like this in the early uh, 20th century sort of dramatizing his death, right? Very, very stylized. Uh, and then if you go to Quebec City, uh, you have this replica of the monument that uh, actually sits outside his ancestral chateau in the south of France. And he's li literally being lifted off the battlefield by an angel, right? So this is uh, obviously mythical history, mythical thinking. Um, and actually, it was sort of funny, I realized that uh, in my own way, at one point in my life, I had actually perpetuated this sort of mythical thinking. And I found that out looking in my basement, and I found a book report that I did for social studies in the sixth grade. So I guess it was the summer before I wrote this. This was, I handed it in on November 29th of 1994 uh, in the Gross Point Public School District in Michigan. Uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, I'd just gotten back from a vacation, family vacation, summer vacation, where we had been to Quebec, and I sort of got very fired up about the stories of Montcalm and Wolfe and the French and Indian War. So I came back and I put this whole thing together. You can't really see it very well, but you know, production value is pretty good for like a 10-year-old. Well, well, I got some maps in there, and apparently I went to the Kinkos and made copies of, you know, Benjamin West's death of General Wolfe and cut it out and found a glue stick. And, you know, Really, really good stuff. Notes, I must have prepared a color map. I mean, the problem, though, is that my teacher wasn't that enthused. Apparently, uh, the only comment he left was, wrong format, and he awarded me 8 out of 10 points. A very inspiring educator. I, you know, I remember him. I think he was a year away from retirement, so I, I get it. I get it. Um, but anyway, uh, this is uh, not good history, right? And nor is this, right? But this is what we do as people. We, we create monuments that, that tell us stories that, that we want to hear, right? Uh, so as you no doubt, you know, you would not be surprised to know that professional historians, particularly in the post-war period, 
you think after World War II, when academia kind of explodes, uh, have totally torn this thing down, right? And instead, Montcalm is presented very, very differently. Right? He's usually presented as a sort of arrogant, obstinate French nobleman uh, who arrives in the colonies, who is very prickly uh, and gets into lots of arguments with the Canadians, in particular the Canadian governor of the colony, Vaudreuil. Uh, he has very little appreciation for Canadians or the way they wage war, and he certainly doesn't have a lot of appreciation for Native Americans. And the sort of line that historians kind of give now is that he shunned their tactics, which were, were called at that time petit guerre, the small war, guerrilla war. Uh, and instead, he really wanted to fight a more conventional European style of war uh, in, in New France. And in the end, historians sort of suggest these disagreements really paralyzed the military command in New France and ultimately led uh, to the demise of, of the colony. And I think there's some truth to that, right? Certainly, if you read his correspondence, it's full of evidence for these disagreements, right? Um, but uh, we should try to empathize a little bit more and understand why he might have been so disdainful of la petite guerre, of Canadian warfare, of native warfare, and why he insisted upon fighting uh, what he hoped to be a conventional European war. And so that brings me to the concept of honor, because throughout this debate in New France, he's trying to position himself in his correspondence back to his administrative superiors in France and the Department of War, as he is trying to uphold the honor of the king's arms, and it's very difficult here in Canada to do so because they fight in very dishonorable ways. So, a little bit of big background here, honor. Uh, honor is a very big deal in 18th century France. Uh, it means something very different than the way that we think about it now. It's not a generalizable term. Uh, it's not something that everybody in French society in the 18th century is entitled to. Right, is capable of possessing. Uh, and so I thought I would bring up a little 18th century intellectual history uh, uh, and talk about Montesquieu, who was you know, a very, obviously, very famous French political theorist and philosopher during this period. In fact, he dies, right, sort of as Mo comes, you know, almost getting ready to come to, to North America. Uh, and he was, some of you might know, he was a major influence upon the framers of our Constitution as well. And he was sort of interested in the different values that are associated with different forms of government, right, and the, and the types of societies uh, that those governments um, have control over. And he kind of laid this out, like, you know, kind of channeling his inner Plato and, you know, trying to figure out all these typologies. Uh, and he said in despotic governments, what makes people act is fear. Right? And that makes sense, right? It's, people act out of fear of tyrants or despots. Uh, and, but in a monarchy, people act out of honor. Bless you. Uh, and honor meant something very particular, right? He said it was the principle of action in monarchies, that it was, quote, a prejudice of each person and of each condition, and that it was the desire for preferences and distinction that drove men to great deeds. Right? Who can gain the royal favor? Who can gain increased titles and honorifics and special privileges? This was Ancien Regime France. Right? This was a hierarchical society of orders in which people were very jealous of their positions, relative positions, and always seeking to advance. Uh, and then, of course, what he said is that when you get rid of monarchies and you have a republic, virtue is what should guide action. Because instead of individuals trying to increase their own honor, relative to the rest of society, uh, people should be acting um, in the public interests, right? And so he looked to republics, the ancient Roman Republic is, is, is full of, you know, the, the, the literature, the discourse on virtue, uh, and that was picked up quite a bit, of course, by the framers and by many of the, uh, the leaders of, of the American Revolution. So that's the type of honor, generally, that I'm talking about with Montcalm. He's in it for himself to a certain extent, but he's trying to become a sort of ideal aristocrat in Ancien Regime France. That is somebody who has gained status and honorifics through performing great deeds in the service of his king. So how does this work, right? He is an aristocrat. So honor in 18th century France is really supposed to be the exclusive province of the aristocracy. Uh, and he very much was an aristocrat. Uh, he came from a very old aristocratic family uh, that goes back to the 12th century, 11th century in French records. Uh, and it was sort of his family background was sort of a mix of what in French was called the, the noblesse de l'épée and the noblesse de la robe. Uh, those are two different types of nobility. The first one, uh, the nobility of the sword, 
was the ancient French nobility that could trace their, their ancestry back to Charlemagne or something like that, right? Um, and then the nobility of the robe uh, were sort of more or less newcomers who had gained nobility uh, either as magistrates or much later, as I'll talk about in a second, simply purchasing the office uh, in a venal system of office holding that, that became increasingly characteristic of, of uh, French society. It became quite a problem, actually. Um, but this is to say that he had a, a deep aristocratic background from both sort of branches of the French aristocracy. Um, and certainly his family pushed him towards that traditional occupation of military service, which was associated particularly with the nobility of the sword. So this is a picture of his sort of ancestral uh, chateau in Condillac, which is not too far from Montpellier. It's in the south of France, very nice part of France. Uh, this is where he grew up, right? Uh, and he entered military service very early. So he became an ensign, uh, I think nine years old. And then if I check my notes here, uh, in 17, his father was able uh, to secure and purchase for him a commission as a captain in this same regiment that he had been an ensign in, the Regiment of Unknown. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware of how this works. In the 18th century, officers' commissions are usually reserved for the aristocracy, and they do have to be gained and then purchased. They're literally investments uh, that aristocratic families make, and they can be passed on uh, to others as well. So he was very much tracked this way, right, um, from, from an early, early age. Um, so what is aristocratic honor in the 18th century, then, for, for a military officer? Um, it's a number of things that might seem familiar to you, right? It's discipline, duty, bravery, and above all else, self-sacrifice uh, in the interests of the king. And this goes back very far. I mentioned the nobility of the sword. Well, here's a map, right, just to give you some sense. Condillac is right around here in the south of France. What's the name? Condillac, that's C-A-N-D-I-A-C. It might be it might be in a town called Saint Ver now, but you we have the internet now, so you can just Google Montcalm uh, Chateau and it'll pop right up. Um, so as I was saying, this goes back a long way, right? This ideal of martial honor uh, being the exclusive you know kind of province of the of the nobility of the sword <coughs> way back, right? And this some of you may have heard of this, the Song of Roland, the Chanson de Roland, one of the first uh, instances of French medieval literature celebrates that ideal. Right, that's part of this genre of French literature, literature called Chansons de Geste, or Songs of Great Deeds, so sort of epic poems. Uh, and it celebrated Roland, right? Highly fictional, right? The story is largely made up. The story is, in the epic poem is Roland is an aristocrat, a noble warrior, uh, either related to Charlemagne or somehow close to him, uh, who, who makes a stand in the pass of the Roncevaux, uh, that's the French word for it, it's in Spain, uh, in the Pyrenees. And at some point in the epic, he refuses to blow his horn to ask for reinforcements. Uh, he wants to sacrifice himself and his men to save the rest of Charlemagne's army. Um, the actual event was probably something quite different. It was, they were probably Basque uh, warriors that ambushed parts of Charlemagne's army. But in the epic, they are Saracens. Right? So there's a deep Christian kind of bent to this. Christian warriors who sacrifice. Right? So the idea is bravery and endurance excuse me, enduring bloodshed to a certain extent. Uh, but when Montcalm enters military service in the 18th century, the ideal of Roland, I'll just say it in English pronunciation, Roland, the idea of Roland is sort of endangered, right? French society has changed quite a bit. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the system of venal office holding. By the time you get to the 18th century, many of the high, no, the, the most important noblemen in France are not nobles of the sort. They have, their families have purchased these titles, right? And they're very different, the old nobility, the nobility of the sort would say, uh, from them. They're decadent, they're corrupt, right? They've, they've gravitated towards Versailles, which has become a symbol of the decline of the old martial valor of French kings, who are supposed to obviously be the chief aristocrat of the, of the kingdom. And this was the king when Montcalm joined service, was Louis XV, right? And he was widely you know, criticized in French society uh, for not living up to these standards. Of course, his, his, you know, his portrait has him with the, the, you know, the medieval armor kind of signifying the, the ancient role of a warrior that was supposed to be uh, taken up by the kings. But what he spent most of his time doing was indulging himself with his mistresses at Versailles. And he famously had this place, Parc au Cerf, the deer park, where he would sort of 
I don't frolic around with his mistresses all day, right? So there was this sense that the nobility was getting soft, essentially. It was diluted by venality, and it had lost its martial glory. Oh. And people took it seriously. So it's actually around this time, a little bit after Montcalm, uh, after the Seven Years' War, that they, they deliberately, the French state deliberately starts trying to reanimate that old noble spirit of martial service and self-sacrifice to the king. So this is the Ecole Militaire, the French military academy in Paris today, right? It's still in the center of Paris. This was created in this period to address the problem. And the idea was, we're going to find provincial nobility, like Montcalm, who again, he's way down here in the provinces, Paris is obviously up here. We're going to attract provincial nobility here who might not have the money and the connections that some of the new wealthier venal aristocrats have. We'll bring them here and we'll teach them these ancient values, right? Of, again, of service and sacrifice. Uh, and we're gonna end up with kind of a new ideal type, right? Of aristocratic army officer one who kind of served from father to son, and they were satisfied after a long career of sacrifice to have the rank of captain and the cross of Saint Louis, which was an honorific medal I'll talk about later, and, and a relatively modest pension and, and retire, right? So th this was ideal, right? And in some ways, Montcalm fit this description, as I mentioned, right? He's a provincial noble. Uh, he has uh, bloodlines of the nobility of the sword. Uh, he's not connected as much in Paris. Uh, maybe he's the type of person who can revive the martial honor of the French nobility. So the question is then, did he live up to this, right? So he starts very early um, in his career. It's the first war that he sees uh, combat in, action, is the War of Polish Succession. But it's really the next war, the War of Austrian Succession, which begins in 1740, uh, where he really, really experiences war in Europe. And I think where his kind of identity as an aristocrat, as an army officer with honor kind of takes shape here. So what is the War of Austrian Succession? It's like many of these European wars, it's fought technically nominally over a succession who's going to succeed a particular throne. There's plenty of them. I just mentioned the War of Polish Succession. Spanish succession. This one was the Austrian succession, dealing with who was going to mount the, the Habsburg throne at that time. Uh, but it quickly metastasized into something much broader, right? And it became a general European war, uh, and it became a pretty nasty one, right? In the end, historians think in about the 10 years or so that it was fought, maybe as many as 400,000 people died as a result of these actions. And it saw some of the greatest pitch battles and sieges of the 18th century, of which Montcalm actually took part, right? Now, the problem was is that it was a disaster for France. With the exception of this famous battle, Fontenoy, uh, this one's very famous, it's the Marshal de Saxe here, the French, uh, the French commander. Uh, Louis XV was actually present at this battle. Uh, so was the Dauphin, the, the heir to France, um, and it was regarded as sort of a masterpiece, uh, and the, the French enemies were, were routed, right? The Duke of Cumberland, the son of the English king, was actually there uh, uh, fighting against the French. But aside from this, the war went very, very poorly for France, and they gained very little diplomatically after the war. Instead, as I'll kind of get to, it was really a string of kind of disasters, right? And so after the war, Right? It's actually Voltaire, the famous French philosopher, uh, who writes a famous poem called, called The Queen of Hungary uh, that kind of laments this. Right? He says, the French and Germans, leagued by wondrous ties, make Christendom one dismal scene of woe, and from their friendships greater ill arise than e'er did from their longest quarrel flow. Would France's treasures were dispersed no more, but prudently within the realm applied, opulence to our cities to restore and make them flourishing on every side. Your labors are of lasting glory, sure, whilst warlike pomps, the triumphs of a day, blaze for a moment, never long endure, but soon like fleeting shadows pass away. So it was sort of a national tragedy that the, the greatest men of letters were sort of giving a kind of poetic gloss here. And it was in this tragedy, as I said, that Montcalm kind of comes of age as a soldier. So there are three major actions that he was part of that I want to try to reconstruct for you. Uh, and I was speaking with some of you over lunch about the problem of sources. Um, part of the problem in reconstructing Montcalm's career in this period is there aren't many sources. Um, he was never a major figure in the French military. 
he was a colonel at best during the war. Um, and apparently the, the French uh, military records and their national military archives in Vincennes outside of Paris don't really contain much. Um, that's the, that's the, what I'm gathering from the footnotes of other historians. Uh, I intend to go there myself at some point and see. But mostly what we're dealing with are a few letter, personal letters from the Montcalm family, some um, references he makes to his earlier service while he's over here later in New France. And then, of course, just other primary sources from other people who were also in these engagements so that you can kind of try to reconstruct what, what it might have been like. Uh, so the first one is the Siege of Prague. This is in 1742. Uh, I'm not sure how great this map is, but you can see, where is Prague? Here we go, up here. Uh, this was one of the opening campaigns of the war. Uh, the Marshal Belial, who was a, a one of the major architects of the French war effort, uh, was ultimately um, uh, there commanding French troops. And what basically happened is French armies penetrated into Bohemia, and they got bottled up in Prague. Uh, and they got bottled up very badly, right? Uh, there were about 40,000 of them trapped, uh, and there were about 70,000 or so Austrian troops surrounding them, right? Uh, and the siege was long and it was grueling. It was many months. Uh, and living in Prague as a soldier then meant a lot of things. Constant bombardment from the, from the, Ottoman, from the Austrians, uh, dwindling lack of supplies, suspicion that the people within the city were gonna turn against the French themselves. Uh, and it went on and on and on. So the siege begins, I can look at my notes again. I believe in Look at your 12th grade paper. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my 12th grade report. Whatever three or four months is before July, because when July hit, they had to make the decision, uh, which unfortunately deceived people have to do, uh, to kill the horses for food, right? Uh, and then it got worse. So you read accounts from those who were trapped within there, and they say after July, when you had to kill the horses, that's when things got really bad. And it was also at that point that attempts by the French to break out of the Austrian lines and forage for supplies as attempts were no longer paying off. And so the army slowly started to kind of disintegrate, right? So when we get to August now, from the original 40,000 men, there's probably about 20,000 left. So this is, this is a pretty epic kind of siege with a lot of suffering involved in it. And we know that Montcalm was there because he writes about it uh, later in life. Uh, he was able somehow to get out in October. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, he might have been able to leave with dispatches. There might have been some agreement for some officers to leave. But he ends back in, fr uh, in France in October. But the siege is actually still going on. right? And the letters coming from Versailles to Belleisle, who is still commanding in Versailles, instruct him that he is not to surrender unless the Austrians will let him have the honors of war and leave with his troops unmolested and march back to France. And the words that, that come from the, the ministry, the, the chief minister of France, Fleury, say that to do so would be the eternal shame and disgrace to the honor of the French arms, right? And so Belial holds out until he absolutely can't anymore. And in one of the kind of more uh, miraculous moments in French military history, the remaining 20 or so thousand troops manage to create a kind of diversion and break through the Austrian lines in the dead of winter and march across the Toppler Mountains, <coughs> not carrying many supplies because they couldn't afford to do so. And they have this 10-day sort of grueling march to make it to a, the, the French held city of Chev. So th this, in other words, is what Montcalm was used to <laughs> when he thought of seizures, right? Is you, you do not surrender, you hold out. Uh, it's not only about the kind of strategic interest, it's also the honor of, uh, uh, of the king's arms at uh, play here. So here's what he wrote. This is the kind of scrap of evidence I have about his experience here. Once he got over to New France, obviously things weren't going so well towards the end. Uh, so he wrote to one of his subordinates, Lévy, he said, the times are going to be harder in some respects here than they were at Prague. Right? But I'm accustomed to adapt myself to whatever happens, and having already given proof of this at Prague, I do not worry about what might happen here. So he's, he's mindful of this, right, as, as he goes forward. Uh, okay, so the next thing that happens to him, he's back in Paris. Apparently he did distinguish himself and was wounded at some point during the siege of Prague before he left. Uh, so he is uh, eventually raised up to a colonel of, of, of a regiment. Uh, and he's then sent into Italy, where the next phase of the war is happening here in the Piedmont 
uh, in the Alps. Uh, and he's involved in this thing called the Battle of Piacenza. Uh, Piacenza was a place where the French, and they were allied to the Spanish at the time, was a place that the Franco-Spanish armies were supposed to hold out in the Po River Valley. Um, they were given orders to defend this at all costs against you know, the advancing Sardinian and, and Austrian uh, forces. Um, and it turned out to be quite a disaster, the same way that the, the siege of Prague had been a disaster. So the battle began on June 16th of 1746, um, and essentially the, the way that the battle played out is that the walls of Piacenza themselves were sort of crumbling medieval walls that weren't going to offer defense. So the French commander decided to bring troops forward and fight on terrain in, before the city. Uh, and as the battle broke out, due to some sort of poor maneuvering on the, the part of the French infantry, most of them got sort of clustered, seemingly, in a spot where they were incredibly vulnerable to Austrian fire. And so the battle began at the, at the break of dawn, and it was over by 2 o'clock. And in that span of about seven or eight hours, 4,005 French soldiers had been killed or wounded, and another 4,500 had surrendered, passing into Austrian captivity. So that's bigger, that dwarfs many civil war battles. That's worse than Antietam, for instance, right, by quite a, quite a factor. The casualty rates in this engagement were 33%. That was the highest of the war, right? And in it, Montcalm's regiment was apparently, according to him, annihilated, and he received several saber wounds. One, I think, to the forehead and another one to the shoulder within those, within those five. So this is what he wrote to his mother about this about the Battle of Piacenza. He's writing after the day after the battle. He said, yesterday we had a most difficult experience. So I'm translating it from the French. The word that he uses, the fascheuse, which is sort of more, more than just difficult, sort of extremely difficult. Uh, he says, a number of officers were killed and wounded. I am among them with five saber cuts. Fortunately, <laughs> none of them are dangerous, notwithstanding that I've lost a great deal of blood, having had an artery severed. A regiment which I twice rallied is annihilated. He's a tough guy. Huh? So if he's, you know, not embellishing here, I mean, he was in the thick of one of the most, you know, difficult uh, military engagements of, of the 18th century. But it's not over, right? The war continues. So his next major battle is in a place that the French call Assiette. It's a pass in the Alps. Pretty, right? <laughs> it wasn't so pretty in the summer of 1747. So here, French forces are now trying to kind of reverse the losses that they experienced from uh, uh, the previous campaign in Italy. And they tried to march through into the Piedmont and take this Alpine pass here. It is guarded, however, by Sardinian and Austrian troops, and they're very well fortified. So the French commander at this point nonetheless decides to make a frontal assault. And there are four of them. And they're turned back, obviously, each time. And each next attempt at assault is more difficult because the bodies of French soldiers are piling up in the way of, of the assault, right? So this goes on for several hours, five hours, right? And this time, the casualties on the French side are 5,300. And for the only time in the entire War of Austrian Succession, the dead outweigh the wounded within those casualty numbers. So 3,700 French soldiers were killed Again, you make comparisons to Civil War battles here, it's, it's, it's more, right? Uh, 299 Sardinians and Austrians were killed compared to the 3,700 French. So this thing was pretty big, right? And actually the commander at the time was the, 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 the uh, younger brother of the, the, the Duke de Belleil who had been in Prague. Uh, his younger brother died in the assault too, actually trying to get up under the Austrian ramparts and plant uh, uh, the, the Bourbon flag. Uh, and once again, Montcalm had been in, in the thick of this thing. So that's a lot they go through, I would think. Uh, that's a very difficult set of campaigns that you sort of miraculously survive. And I think here it kind of merits emphasizing that this was actually quite extraordinary. Right? Most 18th century wars were not like this. Uh, in the 18th century, what you're dealing with are basically fiscal military states fighting each other. That means that most of these states, a massive part of their economic structure is finding ways to finance war so that they are able to keep up in the, the continual dynastic conflicts in Europe. So to lose this many men, to lose assets like this, is really quite a staggering blow to the finances of the state, not to mention the honor of the state, which I'll talk about in a little bit. 
uh, a second. So kind of famously, uh, the historian Colin Jones has this quote from the Marshal de Saxe, who was the, one of the few celebrated French heroes of this war. Uh, the Marshal de Saxe was perhaps exaggerating, uh, but not entirely joking, when he remarked that the sign of a truly great general was to go through one's entire career without having to fight a single pitched battle. Okay. So this is, this is bad, right, for France. There's been multiple pitched battles. They've been disastrous, right? So by 1747, towards the end of the war, it's become quite scandalous, right? Uh, and uh, what's happening is that particularly the kind of Parisian high society is delighting in criticizing the king's ministers and the generals, right? Remember, Louis had a bad reputation. Right, as, a, as a man of war, right? Uh, so again, quoting historian Colin Jones, he writes that from the summer of 1742 on, Paris police spies were reporting a city pulsating with stories, rumors, panics, jokes, and critiques regarding the failing war effort. Even Belle Isle's miraculous escape from Prague was being interpreted as an embarrassment. After all, Bohemia had been lost. Right? And accounts were coming out that the, during the escape from Prague, you know, there had been extraordinary amounts of casualties, which actually wasn't true. So the battles of Piacenza and Bastienne, of course, were seen as much graver kind of instances and exemplars of the incompetence of the French nobility leading the war effort. So in sum so far, in an age, in an age in which risky collisions of expensive armies uh, were generally avoided by senior commanders, Montcalm had served, and apparently served quite courageously, in some of the most devastating pitch battles of the history of the French army under the Bourbons. He had received multiple wounds, uh, and he had even endured captivity in the hands of the enemies. One thing I forgot to mention, uh, at Piacenza, he was taken prisoner. He was found lying with his wounds. Uh, he, was, he was paroled and able to go back to Paris, and then, of course, rejoined the fight, and then get to the thick of it again at Asiat. Uh, so he had done this to elevate his status within the Ancien Regime as an aristocratic man of martial honor, but in the end he had received very little in return. Instead, the defeats in which he had participated uh, and narrowly survived had in fact become objects of ridicule within segments of the French public. And what recognition he did receive, ultimately, a modest and in his eyes actually insufficient pension and the cross of Saint-Louis, these were rather conventional honorifics. Right? Most French officers who served ended up with the Cross of Saint Louis. Right? Uh, so he didn't really get much out of this. Instead, it almost seemed like the honor of his sort of caste within the French system was still uh, questioned. So here we go. Less than ten years later, after that, enter the Seven Years' War, our French and Indian War. Now, with the, the upper echelons of the French military unwilling to take the command of North American forces, that gave Montcalm an opportunity. Right? So he accepted this, right? And many of you know, uh, he was pretty demanding about it <laughs> because it was quite a sacrifice. He wanted an increased salary and a pension. Uh, and he was able to get the, the rank of Major General in Marsha the Cone. Uh, and so we have to think, right, that when he boarded the ships in Brest and France in the spring of, of 56, he felt that the honor of the French aristocracy was sort of at stake here, right? He had come out of this very trying experience in the War of Austrian Succession. The performance of the nobility had been questioned. Uh, here was his opportunity, perhaps, to revive this. So, some of my closing thoughts here. Um, when Montcalm does arrive in North America, of course, he finds himself in very, very different cultures of war, in which conceptions of martial honor are completely different from the ones that he brings. And he recognizes this right, right away, writing that I'm now in a country uh, and in a war where everything is so different than in European <coughs> practice. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled on this, right? As I said at the top of this talk, a lot of historians have commented now about the clash of cultures between uh, sort of metropolitan French conceptions of honor and colonial French conceptions of honor and Native American <coughs> conceptions of French honor. In fact, there's a recent book by a fellow historian of mine, Christine Crouch, uh, but not a pleasure to meet, but uh, I've read her book quite closely, and she looks at all this, so I, I do recommend that. Um, so to begin with, here's the problem. He was subordinate to Governor Vaudreuil. Yes. I thought I put Vaudreuil up here. Maybe I did. I did not. Uh, Vaudreuil was a, uh, he was an aristocrat. Uh, he did descend. His father was a member of the nobility of the sword who had come over from France uh, earlier and served as a governor of, uh, of New France. 
Um, but he was Canadian, right? And that seemed to diminish him in the eyes of Mokam, who was <coughs> French, right? Um, and the other thing is that Vaudreuil did not have any of these types of battlefield experiences that Mokam did, right? So I suspect there was a notion that Vaudreuil uh, might think he knows what he's doing uh, in terms of waging war in Canada, but he really hasn't ultimately paid his dues as, as an aristocrat and an officer in the king's arms. Which leads me to another point. Technically, Vaudreuil is part of the French Navy. That was the, what the colonial administration was part of the, the Ministry of the Marine. And certainly in France in the 18th century, the army is considered much more prestigious. So I can understand when Montcalm comes, he, he thinks that his honor is sort of being diminished here by being subordinate to this person. Right? Now, moreover, the war that Vaudreuil wants him to wage is this petite guerre, this, this essentially kind of what we call guerrilla war. right? Um, a sort of Fabian strategy of harassing uh, British advances into the interior by disrupting their supply lines through ambushes. Um, that's not something that Montcalm sort of considers honorable. Right? Um, Vaudreuil might have had it right. Uh, the British had overwhelming numerical superiority. Uh, they commanded the Atlantic. Um, and maybe the only way to kind of you know, stop this juggernaut was through Petit Guerre's constant harassment, uh, making war harder and harder upon them. Uh, something Washington arguably did during the American Revolutionary War. Um, but uh, Montcalm didn't like this, right? And he continually insisted that the war be fought in a conventional way. And he didn't want to rely upon Canadian militia, Native American allies. Instead, he wanted to rely upon the defenses of New France and use the regular French <coughs> troops that he brought from France, the troops de terre. Right? In fact, the raid at Oswego here in 1756 is not his idea. That's Vaudreuil's idea. Vaudreuil had been wanting to do this for a very long time. And so when that army came here in 1756, it was this big mixed army of native warriors, Canadian militia, right, and French regular troops. It's something Montcalm was a little concerned about being able to pull off. Now, certainly, he, when it worked out, he trumpeted his victory and took credit for it in writing back to France. Uh, but for him, his big triumph comes later at Ticon or Fort Catillon at the time, where he fights conventionally without Canadians, without native uh, warriors, uh, and he repulses uh, British assault, inflicting huge amounts of casualties upon <coughs> British regular troops, right? So, in the end, this doesn't work out for him, right? We know in the Plains of Abraham, he, he goes down, he tries to fight a sort of conventional defense against the besieging British, uh, and he's ultimately killed, and the French lose in, in this battle here. Um, so, in looking at this, as I said, sort of in closing here, you know, historians tend to criticize him for this, right? His inability to adapt to North American war, uh, and they suggest maybe that a less obstinate commander uh, might have been able to save the colony. So famously, the, the truly iconoclastic kind of writer here is uh, the, the, de the dean, really, of sort of history of New France, uh, Bill Eccles, W.J. Eccles, who wrote extensively on this topic uh, earlier in the, in the 20th century. He wrote uh, of Macon that he was extremely vain, determined to have his own way in all things, critical of everything that did not conform to his preconceived ideas, uh, and of anyone who failed to agree with him completely. I'm, I'm like that some days. <laughs> just, just ask my wife, right? So while these characterizations might be correct, I don't think that Montcalm was a particularly gracious person towards the Canadians and Native Americans. I certainly think that he arrived here with, again, I've used this word for sort of prickly, jealous notions of what honor meant and aristocratic honor meant. But given what I've talked about today, maybe we can empathize a little bit more. Perhaps if any of us had been through what he had been through fighting in Europe, right? Maybe we too would have arrived in New France and been unwilling to compromise those notions of honor that we brought with us. Maybe we would have tried to win the war that way, and then according to the ideal that eventually was gonna be put forth in the École Militaire, kind of return to France with your honor intact, with a bigger pension, right? Um, and retire, right? So thank you very much. How much time we have for questions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Can I just see what he had just started? Just crazy. How old was he? He started out very young. He, he got, became an ensign at nine years old. And he was a teenager when he first saw action in the War of uh, Polish Succession. That's pretty common, right? Because aristocratic sons were tracked for things like that. It was very important for the fathers of aristocratic sons to line up 
these solutions to, to get them going. So he lived his whole life as a soldier, which I think is kind of to the point that I'm speaking about here is that he comes here a fully formed French aristocrat and military officer with very you know, firm ideas about what, what that actually means. Did you? Why would France make him subordinate to a Montreal person, a yeah. colonist, so to speak? That just blows my mind. The British would never have done that. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, is that, as I mentioned before, the colony of New France is technically part of the French naval department. Yeah. And the Navy appoints a governor general to come over to New France. And he is technically in charge of all military affairs in the colony. And there's a second official, something called an intendant, who's in charge of sort of civil affairs. But the governors of New France have traditionally been the military leaders. And so the idea was, I think, uh, sending him over is that Vaudreuil knew how to wage war over here. Montcalm was definitely in charge of the king's forces and he would be operating in the field, but he was supposed to kind of take Vaudreuil's lead in that. But yeah, I mean, it's a classic case, it's you, you divide authority. Now, had he come over with full authority to do whatever he want, I suspect Vaudreuil would have tried to undermine him as well. So it might, we might have gotten the same outcome anyway of kind of a, a bickering you know, command. But yeah, it is an interesting question as far as the uh, yeah, we're in the back. A speculative question. If uh, Montcalm had survived the Battle of Quebec on planes and had been forced to capitulate, would he have been honored if he had returned to France? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good speculative question. I mean, what happens after the war is that there's a huge trial over all this in uh, in, in France. Called the, it's called the L'Affaire du Canada, the Canadian Affair. Uh, in which pe people view the fall of New France as a, as a calamity. It was not a very profitable colony. It wasn't even that incredibly strategic, but it was lost, right? And so actually the point of inquiry was on French officials. The, the, the blame fell to uh, Vaudreuil, the governor, um, and to Bigot, who was the intendant. And they were basically accused, amongst other things, of embezzling funds, of being corrupt officials who had kind of drained the power of, of the French army and led to its collapse. Vaudreuil was exonerated, Bigot had to pay some money back. Uh, they both uh, spent some time in the, in the Bastille, in the Bastille. Um, and so I think in some ways, I have to look into it a little bit more, but I, I think in some ways by dying on the field, he became, you know, this figure that you could mythologize about, you know. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's interesting. I assume if he had survived and they had gotten back to France, he would have been in the thick of a big dispute over culpability, you know. Yeah, it probably would have been a more interesting trial. But I think that's probably the best I can answer that at this point. Yeah, here in the middle. Uh, can you recommend a biography of one kind? Well, that's the problem, is that there haven't been really modern, updated biographies of him. Uh, I, I would say look at some of the more recent literature on the Plains of Abraham. Peter McLeod has written a book called Northern Armageddon, and he kind of touches on them. Most of the big biographical treatment was done by 19th century writers, and they tend to look at, now there are some you know, trade publications that you wouldn't consider academic publications uh, that might look in, in, into him, but the source material to me, at least, and I hope I'm not completely wrong about this, seems pretty thin, and we seem to get the same kind of narratives coming out that focus mostly on what happens when he gets here, rather than what happens before, right? So I can't, unfortunately I can't recommend a perfect biography, but I would look at the more recent stuff that's come out of the French anymore. Sure. Why didn't he stay holed up in Quebec City, the bastion there? Yeah. He could have just holed up, why didn't that's he That's the classic to the question. Why did he bring the army out in front of the walls and come back? In hindsight, it looks like if he had stayed there, Wolf's forces would have been trapped on the Plains of Abraham because there were other French columns closing in. And Wolf was pretty desperate at that point, actually, too. Some, some people think that was sort of his last gasp. Um, we don't know. I guess the supposition is that he thought that the forces massed on the Plains of Abraham, if he didn't dislodge them, then he couldn't, he couldn't en end up doing it. You know? But it is interesting that he brings his troops out in this frontal assault, and he had been a part of all these frontal assaults in, uh, in, in Europe. I don't know, it might be reenacting trauma. You know? Maybe you really need to get a psychologist in here. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a classic question. Uh, I don't know. But it's true. I mean, had he not, it's possible. If Quebec hadn't fallen, the diplomatic arrangements at the end of the war might have been different. They might have retained Canada. So, yeah. Oh, am I, am I over here? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I just thought Montcalm's crushing blow. Yep, yeah. From what you said, it's this role. I have to one up. 
No, that's great. Yeah, that's from Rene Chantron, who spoke here two years ago, right? He's a, a renowned Canadian military historian. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is the only work of modern scholarship devoted to the siege of Oswego com completely. Um, and that's a great one. If you actually look in the back, the bibliography, you're able to get most of those resources online. Those primary sources have been uploaded to, to archive.org if you go there. Research has gotten very, very digital. But yeah, that's an excellent book. Uh, it's, it's what we've gotten now. I'm actually hoping to produce something larger than that, but we'll see. <laughs> Two kids, full-time job. <laughs> mortgage, two cars, the whole work? Yeah, mortgage, two cars, one lease, one on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some, somebody had a hand up there. <laughs> the the Balkan book? Yes. Yeah, it's by Rene Chartron. It's actually right up there on the on the table. Yeah. It's part of that Osprey series that looks at military campaigns. It's a, it's a great primer uh, to, to the campaign, and it touches on what common gives you, as I said, kind of leads to sources that you can access that aren't, you know, archival buried in, in France. So, okay, well, th thank you very much. I'll be around in this